Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Subhashis Basu from London, United Kingdom. Dr. Basu is a consultant musculoskeletal radiologist with his private practice locations based in Cheshire, Man Manchester, Lancashire, and London. His NHS base is at Brightington Hospital in the United Kingdom. Dr. Basu graduated from the St. Bartholomew's and the Royal London School of Medicine, University of London. He then completed general clinical radiology and higher subspecialty training in MSK imaging at then Northwest Deanery School of Radiology in Manchester. This was followed by a further subspecialist training during a one-year MSK and sports imaging fellowship at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London. Dr. Basu holds uh, several positions, including a visiting professor at the Manchester Metropolitan University, and also a senior honorary lecturer at the University of Salford, where he's passionately involved in education of postgraduate students. He lectures at both national and international meetings and is very keen on publishing his research. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Subhashis Basu from the United Kingdom. Over to you. Thank you, Hitesh. Thank you for your uh, kind invitation to speak again. It's always an honor and a pleasure to speak um, on the Orthopedic Principles platform and welcome to all our guests and delegates who are here to watch and thank you for giving up your your time, this precious time uh, on this Sunday, um, afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are. So my name is Shubh Basu and I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist based at Risington Hospital uh, in the northwest of England. And my remit today is going to talk to you about uh, musculoskeletal radiology and how we can help treat upper limb conditions. As a musculoskeletal radiologist, working at a tertiary unit, orthopedic unit at Risington Hospital, we often see a huge volume of orthopedic and rheumatology related cases. And hopefully I can just cover a few of the things that we, we go through in our clinical practice. So I've divided the, the talk um, essentially into two parts. I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the diagnostic shoulder uh, in imaging uh, modalities that we have at our disposal. And also I'm going to talk to you about the therapeutic interventions that we can perform in the MSK radiology department that may help um, our clinical colleagues. So moving on to diagnostic shoulder interventions. So with shoulder intervention, it really does depend on what, um, what it, you know, what, what it is, what the problem is and what is it that you want to solve. And that will certainly re rely on the, the kind of pathology that you're questioning. And that's determined by going back to basics, your accurate clinical history, and examination skills. And then you want to use imaging to help try and confirm um, some of your differential diagnoses that I hope you would have generated from your, from your clinical examination. So what weapons do we have in our armory in the MSK radiology department to help you? So the, the commonest uh, imaging modalities I've listed there for you, starting off with x-rays and ultrasound, and then we have our cross-sectional imaging, such as CT scans, MRI scans, and MRI arthrograms. I've not mentioned anything around nuclear medicine um, and things like bone scans and SPECT CT, which are now increasingly used in our clinical practice, but that's a whole talk in itself. And I'm not a dedicated nuclear medicine uh, physician, so um, that's probably best left to somebody who is better in the knowledge of that. So moving on to x-ray. So, you know, what, what, what's good about x-rays? X-rays or radiographs are often the initial choice of imaging, certainly in our clinical practice. And it's really good in the context of assessment of trauma. So if you're looking to exclude fractures and dislocations or acute bony injuries, radiographs are generally quite good at being able to help you with that. Radiographs are also helpful in the chronic setting. So if patients present to you with chronic symptoms, uh, with pain and weakness, reduced range of movement. You know, radiographs are quite useful to be able to identify any um, potential arthritis, whether it's in the glenocumal joint or the acromioclavicular joint in the shoulder. And other uses include looking for things like calcification in the context of calcific tendinopathy of the rotator cuff. So x-rays are a reasonable option to go for in the first instance. Moving on to ultrasound, here's an image of, of the supraspinatus tendon in the, in the shoulder here. Um, why, is, why is ultrasound an imaging modality that you should consider? Well, certainly in the context of uh, rotator cuff disease, ultrasound is really good at picking up changes along the lines of rotator cuff tendinopathy, as well as assessing 
for partial thickness or full thickness rotator cuff tears. I talked about calcification um, in the rotator cuff with, with radiographs. You can also identify calcification on ultrasound fairly, um, fairly easily. Other things that you can assess with ultrasound of the shoulder include looking for biceps tendon pathology, uh, evaluating the AC joint again, and also assessment of the different bursae around the shoulder, the largest being the subacromial slash subdeltoid bursa for any signs of bursitis or thickening. The other positive um, features around ultrasound include it's a dynamic study. So by that, I mean, I have the patient in front of me. I can have a conversation with the patient to work out where their symptoms are, how it started, et cetera, and corrob corroborate that with my, with my imaging. I can also move the patient's shoulder around in, into different positions, not only to assess the different rotator cuff tendons, which then get um, shown in the, in the different positions, but also patients often say, I have pain in this position, doc. And then by moving into those positions, you can sometimes help to identify the underlying pathology. It is certainly operator dependent. So by that, I mean ultrasound in the right hands, in experienced hands with, with good knowledge, you can actually glean a lot of information out. So uh, depending on who you're sending your ultrasounds to, if they're very good at it and they do it day to day in, as part of their clinical practice, then you should get really good information out of that. What are the downsides? What are the negatives to ultrasound, however? So I put operator dependent here again at the top and you might think, well, that's strange. He, he put that as a, as a positive. How can this be a negative? Well, equally in the wrong hands, certainly in people that are not so experienced with ultrasound, you know, ultrasound may um, cause more problems than, than, than solve solutions. So it's very important, especially nowadays, we see so many more ultrasound courses out there and so many different um, people from all uh, walks of, of life really trying to gain access to ultrasound to be able to use as part of their clinical practice. I have no objections really against that, but I think if you're going to offer ultrasound to your patients, you must be well-trained and well-experienced in that. Again, I've mentioned here a dynamic live study. So that's a positive, but it can also be a negative because we often um, you know, look at ultrasounds and images are taken if, if, if in all honesty, more for the record than anything else, you know, it's very easy to get asked to review MRI scans or CT scans and x-rays because these are static images, whereas reviewing ultrasound scans retrospectively, certainly the images that are taken don't really give us the full picture because I'm just reviewing then images that have been captured or stored by the operator at the time. I don't get to see the whole structure in its entirety live. So that can be a drawback. In the context of shoulder ultrasound, it can be less accurate, certainly in the context of grading for muscle atrophy, particularly if there are any underlying rotator cuff tears. And these are important prognostic features that an orthopedic surgeon would like to know about before they embark on any um, rotator cuff repair. Ultrasound may be good at looking at these superficial tendons and soft tissues, but it has a very poor um, assessment to, to look at the intra-articular structures when it comes to things like the glenoid labrum or the articular chondral surfaces outlining the glenoid and humeral head. Ultrasound and sound waves don't travel well through, through bone and solid tissue, so it's very difficult to assess those intra-articular structures and you may need to consider alternative imaging modalities. And also finally, ultrasound can be limited, especially if your patient is limited with their range of movement. If patients are in excruciating pain and they're, they're unable to move their arm fully, that has a negative impact on our ultrasound assessment because we need to be able to move the arm in various positions to be able to identify the various rotator cuff tendons on offer. And if the patients can't do that, we can't do that. And then that means a limited ultrasound report going back to you as a clinician. Moving on to CT now. So the advantages of CT are, you know, think of it as a, an upgraded version of your radiographs. You know, it's very good for looking at the osseous morphology and you can identify the trabecular pattern within the bones. Uh, just like in x-rays, CT is very good at assessment of fractures and dislocations, but also in terms of serial imaging to look at the progress of any healing of any older fractures and looking for any osseous union and the signs for that. Arthritis can also be uh, accessed with CT and evaluated. Remember with CT, we can reconstruct in multiple planes. So it's very useful for an orthopedic surgeon to then be able to identify that, particularly with the 3D reconstructions uh, to assess and evaluate um, patients in the context of glenohumeral joint arthritis, uh, looking at glenoids and glenoid erosions 
if these patients then are going on to have templating for uh, shoulder replacement surgery. And finally, CT is very useful um, or certainly can be useful in the context of implant imaging to look for a periprosthetic um, abnormalities and loosen and lucency in, in the context of loosening, which could be aseptic or septic loosening. Remember, we can use metal artifact reduction sequences to help um, optimize the imaging. The negatives of CT include it does involve using ionizing radiation. So that's one of the drawbacks. And also it has a relatively poor contrast resolution when you compare it with either ultrasound and certainly with MRI scans when you're wanting to evaluate structures such as soft tissues and the rotator cuff or, or muscle. Moving on to MRI now. So advantages of MRI are it has a very uh, positive and superior soft tissue contrast capability compared with CT. And it's usually the imaging modality of choice if you want to evaluate the rotator cuff to look for any underlying disease, which could be simple tendinopathy to complex tearing. It can also assess the articular chondral surfaces in, in, in the glenohumeral joint, as well as assess the acromioclavicular joint, which, can, which is a very known common pain generator and one joint that should not be forgotten when, when evaluating the shoulder. And as an ultrasound, MRI can also assess the surrounding soft tissues, as well as look for any bursal fluid distension in the context of bursitis. The drawbacks can be that MRI is not as readily accessible um, and available compared with the other imaging modalities. Although I think this is certainly changing as the years go by, um, most imaging centers will have an MRI scan for sure, um, but it's not always easy to go and get that quick MRI just because it takes time, remember, to scan a body part, a good 15, 20 minutes if you're going to do it properly. Um, so compared with an X-ray or ultrasound, MRI might not be as readily accessible. There are contraindications, although, you know, in, in previous talks and previous iterations, I used to talk about absolute contraindications to MRI, which could be metalwork and pacemakers and things like that. However, nowadays, with more and more uh, new uh, machines and different vendors coming on stream, it's certainly acceptable and possible to scan patients that may have cardiac pacemakers, particularly in um, uh Suitably facilita uh, suitable facilities where, certainly in cardiothoracic centers, especially where uh, under, under strict clinical control, pacemakers can be controlled for the purposes of MR. And also with metal work now and metal artifact reduction sequences, we can often evaluate the structures immediately around the, the interface between metal work and bone far more better than we could in the early years of MRI. Claustrophobia is really important, and I, it's a bit of a bugbear of mine, and I always talk about this. Um, and the reason I do is because patients can often find MRI scans intolerable because of claustrophobia. It's a very narrow tunnel they have to pass through, and patients can't necessarily lie still um, for a confined space of time. Remember, if you're in pain and you're asking somebody to lie still for the purpose of the scan, that can be quite difficult for 15, 20 minutes. You might, you might be able to manage that for one or two minutes, but 15, 20 minutes can be quite difficult, especially if the position we want the patient in um, reproduces the pain. And if patients start moving around, the image quality starts to degrade. And that's one of the bugbears when I start to report those scans, because then unfortunately, you often see the lines in the reports that state, image degradation owing to motion artifacts, et cetera. So make sure that if your patients um, are able to tolerate MR, that, they, that, that they're certainly not claustrophobic because, you know, if those patients don't uh, tolerate the MR, we're just wasting everyone's time there, not least the patients, and we delay their, their, their management plan. MR can be time consuming, as I mentioned. Um, it's not a quick um, few seconds of doing an x-ray. It certainly takes a good 15, 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes to get a good MRI shoulder scan with the right sequences and the right planes. And that's also assuming that the patients are, 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 st are steady and able to tolerate the scan. And finally, MRI is prone to artifact, as I mentioned, around metal work and motion artifact. There's not, there's not a lot we can do. Moving on to arthrograms, so focusing on MRI arthrograms. So what are arthrograms? It's essentially injection of contrast medium into the joints, which we do under image guidance. It's completely up to you as the operator whether you want to do that under x-ray guidance or under ultrasound guidance. We're just using imaging to guide the needle into the correct joint space and then injecting contrast. And the beauty about arthrograms is it helps to assess better uh, intra-articular structures and pathology that you can't necessarily glean information out of with, with a plain scan. 
Here's a spot image taken under fluoroscopy of a glenohumeral joint um, arthrogram study prior to the patient moving on to MRI. And you can just see here, here's the needle um, that's entering the glenohumeral joint in the area of the rotator interval. Everything that's black here is the contrast that's been injected into the joint. And this is kind of going all the way around the joint effectively. So that's the kind of image we want to see when we know we're in the joint. And the common indicators for MR arthrograms in the shoulder include the evaluation for capsular labral ligamentous injuries, um, particularly in the context of instability in the shoulder. So we're talking about those shoulder dislocations, um, people with apprehensive shoulders where they may get anterior or posterior or even multi-directional instability. Here, the image on the left demonstrates that normal um, shoulder, the kind of human joint filling with contrast as we put that in through the arthrogram. But here's an example where just before the patient went on to have the MRI, I suspected there may be an underlying Hagel lesion. And the reason I say that is, again, as we feel contrast through, it might be projecting not as well, but on my screen, you can see the outline of the, of the auxiliary pouch here of the joint capsule, but there's a little bit of subtle contrast just here um, underneath the capsule, which you can't see on that on, on, on a normal one. And then based on this image, I suspected before the patient went to the MR that there may well be an underlying Hagel lesion. You know, I put about 12 mils of contrast in, in, in generally. It can vary depending on the person and the size, but on average. So I don't try to over distend the joint because sometimes the over distension, you can get contrast exacerbation. So you have to be careful about that. And lo and behold, when the patient had the MRI, you could see this contrast extravasating actually um, inferior to the joint capsule where there was an underlying Hagel lesion that was confirmed, a humeral avulsion of the glenohumeral ligament. Now, I mentioned earlier about artifact and the prone, uh, the MR being prone to artifact from metalwork. So here's a rugby player, an elite, elite athlete, um, not far from where we are, that was referred for an MRI arthrogram. He's already had previous surgery for anterior stabilization, and this time he presented with posterior instability symptoms. Unaware of the operator, he had previous surgery that involved metallic stabilization, stabilization screws um, through the anterior glenoid. And when he went on to uh, when he went on to the MRI scanner, here's a bit of contrast coming out of the back. When he went on to the MR scan, this is what we were left with. Impossible to make any uh, meaningful information or glean any meaningful information out of that. Luckily, we had a CT scanner next door. So what we did was we transferred the patient onto CT. And this patient with posterior instability features now, you could just about make out, here's a, here's a sagittal and here's a coronal plane reformat of the, of the CT arthrogram that was performed. You can just make out here a nice crescentic rim of posterior glenoid. Um, here's a small glenoid rim fracture posteriorly. Uh, and you can just see that here on the uh, on the CT coronal reformat posterior inferiorly. Note those metallic screws anteriorly here. So here's an example where CT helped us bail out from, from, um, from a poor MR uh, arthrogram. So that's what I wanted to say from a diagnostic point of view in terms of the interventions uh, that we have on offer to assess your patients with, with shoulder pathology. Moving on now to the therapeutic wing of shoulder intervention. So the commonest things that we tend to inject um, to treat symptoms usually of pain and inflammation include local anesthetic, corticosteroids, and I'm going to talk to you also about harder dilatations, which is a procedure that we use to manage frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. With corticosteroids, first of all, it's commonly used, and I'm pretty sure most people have injected corticosteroids for their patients um, that are presented with inflammation and pain. It's routinely injected into various joints, into bursae around the body, um, as well as around tendon sheaths and soft tissues. Its anti-inflammatory uh, nature helps, and it can vary um, in terms of its potency and solubility with different corticosteroids on the market. Commonest indicators, again, tend to be for things like arthritis. Um, it's been used in rheumatology, um, as well as bursitis and tenosynovitis features. They're generally quite safe in the grand scheme of things with a reasonably low risk of complications. Of course, the main thing to always be concerned about is infection. And that's something that I always consent patients for. Although the risk of infection is very, very low, you must proceed with aseptic um, technique and make sure that you have a sterile field in place. I also mentioned cosmetic, particularly in the context of uh, young females that may have injections in, in very superficial areas that may become a cosmetic problem later on because of the side effects of potential skin discoloration or lipoatrophy as a result, particularly of certain steroids. 
Um, I've known colleagues and, and institutions have been sued because uh, this was not um, made apparent to the patient at the time about the cosmetic side effects. Uh, I often I talk about I talk to the patients about the fact that you know you may well have a bit of discoloration on the skin which can look like a bruise and it can be permanent. So I think it's very important to make sure you you explain those potential risks to patients, particularly with superficial injections. Now, corticosteroids can have local, but as well as that, you can get systemic adverse side effects. And if you just take out the leaflet from the vial of, of any steroid or any medication for that matter, you often find a big list of side effects. And I don't go through all of them, but the key things that I do look out for in the clinical history and during the consent process is to make sure the patients aren't diabetic. If they are, particularly if they are type one insulin dependent diabetic, then I will always explain to them that, you know, over the next few days following on from an injection, uh, you may notice that the blood sugars can fluctuate um, before they start to stabilize. And that can happen anything from seven to 10 days. So I often warn patients about that so that they're not alarmed. Certain corticosteroids can have an impact on people that, are, that have epilepsy and are, are on anti-epileptics. Uh, because the, the steroid can lower the seizure threshold. So I'd like to know if patients have got epilepsy or if they take any anti-epileptic medication. Antiretroviral therapy, ARV, in the context of HIV, sometimes um, there are certain corticosteroids that can um, reduce the viral um, hold. So that's something to be aware of. And finally, anticoagulants. Um, if patients are on blood thinners, you know, I always want to make sure that the, the patients are safe. And usually with my musculoskeletal injections, I often tell patients, look, my injections are, are cold procedures. These are elective procedures. You know, you're on anticoagulation for, for a very good reason, a far more important reason in, 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 some, in some ways. And I rarely get patients to stop their anticoagulants prior to an injection, depending on what I do. Um, so that's something just to be aware of in the clinical history. Moving on to the ultrasound guided injections. Well, why would you want to refer somebody for an injection with, with us under ultrasound guidance? It's relatively quick, it's relatively inexpensive to do, and it's minimally invasive. Okay, so I'm going to stick a needle into a patient, but it's far better than going on for an operation and going into theater, right? So if we can manage these patients um, relatively quickly and with minimal invasion, then that's the name of the game. Remember, patients can walk in and walk out after 15, 20 minutes having had the procedure. The beauty about using image guidance, and in this case, ultrasound, is it helps me to visualize the targets and I can avoid important structures like the blood vessels and nerves around. But the key thing for me when it comes to ultrasound injections, as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is the planning of it. And we talk about in-plane and out-of-plane injections. So the planning is very, very important. Uh, it's not a case of sticking an ultrasound probe and then marking the skin and then guiding a needle uh, and guiding a needle in without any kind of due care. It's about working out what structure is required to be injected positioning the patient appropriately, positioning yourself as an operator appropriately, um, and then planning how you're going to inject and where you're going to inject. The two types of injection um, planes include the in-plane and outer plane techniques. And in, an in-plane um, injection essentially involves passing the needle along the long axis of the ultrasound probe and the ultrasound beam. And what that ena enables you to do, as illustrated on the left-hand image here, is you get to see the needle um, generally along its entirety. And that's very important. So here, the ultrasound image on the left demonstrates the artifact that we get from the needle presence in an in-plane technique, so a longitudinal uh, procedure. Conversely, you can perform outer plane um, in, uh, injections whereby your needle is coming in perpendicular to the, to the course of the um, ultrasound beam. So all you're going to see is like a, a sharp, bright spot on your ultrasound image as seen here at the bottom. So this is where uh, you see an outer plane um, needle procedure. This is technically a bit more difficult than an in-plane and certainly if you're starting off, people are taught to, to learn the in-plane technique. I reserve the outer plane technique myself when I'm injecting small joints, which I can find very useful, whether it's the chromium clavicular joint, for example, or the base of thumb uh, CMC joint in the context of arthritis. So this is quite a useful technique to, to have at your disposal if you were to perform these. So moving on to shoulder um, conditions, you can, you know, I remember talking to one of my orthopedic colleagues at Wrightington and he mentioned, you know, you, know, you can divide shoulder pathology or shoulder practice 
literally into four main pillars. Uh, you can divide them into impingement and assessment for rotator cuff disease. You can divide it into glenohumeral instability and have a cohort of patients presenting with that. Osteoarthritis, particularly in the elderly, and frozen shoulder, which can affect um, anyone really. Um, we're commonly seen in, in females in, the, in, in, you know, usually in their 40s. So shoulder practice can be divided into these four, four pillars. When it comes to rotator cuff disease, you know, where does ultrasound uh, therapy and in image guidance help? So ultrasound guided subacromial bursal injections for bursitis can be really useful um, when you're injecting corticosteroid and mixed with some local anesthetic. The images here and the illustrations on the left demonstrate how you would position the probe and how you would guide the needle in an in-plane technique to access the subacromial bursa, which is outlined here in blue. You can see on the top image, um, this ultrasound uh, sonogram demonstrating the supraspinatus tendon with the subacromial bursa slightly distended here, superiorly. Here's an in-plane technique with the needle passing through where we can access the bursa and inject corticosteroid and anesthetic. Barbitage is basically dry needling of calcification in the context of calcification of the rotator cuff. So here, again, the procedure and the positioning is very similar to a simple subacromial bursal injection. But here on the sonogram, you can see supraspinatus tendon with calcium, all these, all these little bright echogenic foci within the um, tendon substance corresponds to calcification and calcific tendonitis, of which there's a relatively heavy burden in this particular patient. And here we can see the needle extending into the subacromial bursa, um, as well to inject a bit of corticosteroid and anesthetic. So with my practice, I tend to use a bit of saline as well and see if I can literally fenestrate with a, with a, with a wide bore needle um, into the calcification, break it down, fragment it down, and then using a bit of warmed saline I find useful to try and withdraw back and aspirate. And sometimes it, it, it can be quite fruitful in doing that. And then at the same time, I will access the subacromial bursa and inject a bit of corticosteroid and local anesthetic. Remember I mentioned about AC joint. It's a, it's a small joint, nonetheless an important joint because it's a common pain generator in patients with shoulder, presenting with shoulder symptoms. So never forget the shoulder and the AC joint in particular. Here we've got a sonogram that demonstrates a bit of joint space reduction, but more uh, florid is the degree of capsule of thickening that we can see overlying the superior margin of the AC joint. And patients can often present with this. Um, and it can be quite tender. So when I'm scanning patients, I will often place the probe on the AC joint to scan and press down and ask the patient, is that tender or not? Whether it is or not will then be put into my report so that the referring clinician is aware. Um, in terms of injecting the AC joint, it's quite simple. You can inject using an in-plane approach, breaching through the capsule to access the joint um, as seen here on the image on the left. Um, you can also go transverse with the image on the right here. Um, so you're going perpendicular to the long axis of the AC joint, but it's still an in-plane technique because you're seeing most of the needle going through the long axis of the ultrasound beam. We get asked to also inject around the long head of biceps tendon if there's any signs of inflammation, such as tendinitis or tenosynovitis. And remember the long head of biceps tendon also communicates with the glenohumeral joint. So whatever you put around the tendon here will inevitably track back into the glenohumeral joint. Here, the image on the left is an axial fluid sensitive image, uh, fluid sensitive sequence uh, demonstrating a long and a biceps tendon, which has a bit of a cleaved appearance. There may well be a small interstitial split um, and there's a bit of fluid around the tendon sheath as well, as well as some joint fluid. Here in ultrasound, this is how you position the patient with the probe transverse generally across. And you can see the greater and the less trochanters in that particular projection. And we've got a nice echogenic appearance of the long head of biceps tendon here outlined with this asterisk. Now, by slightly externally rotating the arm outwards, what happens is this groove starts to turn um, more anti-clockwise. So then this U shape can often become like a C shape. And when that happens, you, you have greater access then to bring your needle in through to inject into the bicepital groove. And here we can see that on the image on the uh, right here, an in-plane um, technique to insert some steroid and anesthetic, low-dose steroid and anesthetic around the biceps.
Here's an example of rotator cuff arthropathy. And rotator cuff arthropathy is usually a combination of severe rotator cuff disease, which could imply full thickness or high grade cuff tears, as well as glenohumeral joint osteoarthritis. Now, in some patients, these patients will maybe go on to have a reverse total shoulder replacement. Um, those patients that are not fit for surgery or perhaps decline surgery may be managed by um, injecting the suprascapular nerve and providing a suprascapular nerve block under ultrasound guidance. The suprascapular nerve carries those nociceptive pain fibers um, back from the shoulder, literally around the glenohumeral joint, from the subacromial bursa, the AC joint, the joint capsule, all these structures that are common pain generators. And the idea is to switch those pain receptors off with, with our injection. Now, the suprascapular nerve arises from the upper trunk of the brachial plexus, and it passes through the posterior triangle of the neck, just deep to the trapezius before it enters the supraspinous fossa via the suprascapular notch. And it's within that suprascapular notch, as seen here on this ultrasound, that we need that we get access to, uh, to be able to inject the suprascapular nerve. So this is generally medial, this side is lateral, and we have the transverse uh, suprascapular ligament that traverses the, the superior aspect of the suprascapular notch. The nerve sits here, and my kind of technique tends to aim for the lateral floor of the suprascapular notch and literally inject fluid. So my needle kind of goes over the suprascapular nerve. And also there's a tiny artery invariably seen with ultrasound. You can see something pulsating away. Or if you put Doppler on, you can see uh, the suprascapular artery being um, highlighted there. So I try to bypass and not hit those structures by going over the top, aiming for the lateral floor of the suprascapular notch, and then literally bathing the, the notch with corticosteroid and anesthetic. And what you want to be able to see is a bit of dilution and distension, if you like, of the ligament as well to know that you're, you're firmly in there. Moving now on to frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. There is no right or wrong way of performing this procedure. You can perform it under ultrasound or you can perform it under fluoroscopic guidance. And just like with arthrograms, we are just using imaging to, to help guide the, the needle into the right space. So for the purpose of a presentation, it's far easier to highlight some of the features that I want to show by um, using the fluoroscopic technique. Now, in terms of management for frozen shoulder, which is fairly common, and I must say during this pandemic, nearly over the last, you know, nearly coming up to two years or so, you know, hydrodilatation has been one of the kind of major procedures that I've performed in, 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 my, in my clinical practice. Um, and in terms of management, how can you manage frozen shoulder? Well, uh, patients can do this themselves by taking some tablets, oral analgesia or anti-inflammatories. Um, and if that doesn't help, then potentially a joint injection. So an intra-articular corticosteroid injection may help. Um, hydrodilatation, which I'm going to talk to you about. And then finally, there's surgery. Um, and I know in some places, surgery tends to be the first line. Um, and it can be anything between a manipulation and anesthetic versus an arthroscopic capsular release and ACR. But in my clinical practice and with the surgeons that I work with, we tend to go down the route of a hydro dilatation first, as it's a relatively simple procedure that can be formed in an outpatient setting. And like I say, patients walk in and walk out after 15, 20 minutes having been treated for their frozen shoulder. I put physiotherapy here in bold at the bottom because this literally underpins everything else that we do. So even before the patient comes to see us, hopefully they would have been having some physiotherapy. They often present to us because the physiotherapy has kind of hit a roadblock and they're not able to move their arm as much anymore or the pain is just too substantial. And that's where we come in. But I always say that physiotherapy is far more important than what I do with my hydrodilatation. So hydrodilatation or capsular distension arthrography can provide benefit in two ways. It can cause capsular distension and thereby try to break down the scar tissue that forms around the shoulder capsule. And I used to believe in that at the beginning, but now I feel it's more about weakening those bands of scar tissue because those bands of scar tissue can be fairly, fairly strong um, and quite tough to break down, particularly under arthroscopy. So um, the distension part of the procedure certainly should help to try and weaken the bands of scar tissue, if anything else. And then at the same time, we inject the steroid, the intraarticular corticosteroid, to help reduce inflammation. So if patients can control their pain symptoms, they're going to be more compliant with physiotherapy again and moving their shoulder, and that will hopefully get them towards the finishing line and break them from that from that vicious cycle. Now, some patients can uh, can claim that they get benefit immediately from the hydrodilatation. Or, and I think more commonly in my practice, it takes 
several weeks um, to really optimize from the hydrodilatation alongside physiotherapy where patients have improved pain scores and then certainly get improved range of range of motion. Now, hydrodilatation is not a new procedure. It's been around for quite some time. And the mail is a, is a, is a newspaper um, that's available here in the UK. And I've just shown, you know, I think the newspaper, the journalist, the health, the health editor, I think has a fascination with frozen shoulder because every four or five years, they seem to publish something along those lines um, as highlighted with these three different articles over a span of nearly 10 years. But it's certainly been around a while. So what do we do in our practice? So for me, I'm always going to look for an x-ray first of all. Has the patient had previous imaging and is there a previous x-ray available for me? And I'll explain why in my next slides. I'm going to consent the patient an informed written and available consent to go through the procedure so the patient is fully aware of what is expected of them from us and also explain how the procedure goes. And then, like I said earlier, you can perform the procedure either under x-ray guidance or fluoroscopy with the patient lying supine most often, and you access the shoulder joint using an anterior rotator interval approach, as the images are all going to show in the next few slides. Uh, you can also perform the, the procedure under ultrasound. So with that, you can either have the patient sat up or more commonly, I prefer having the patients lying down in a kind of lateral decubitus position on their side. And then I access the joint posteriorly, so a posterior glenohumeral joint. I must say my practice has certainly morphed more now towards an ultrasound guided um, hydrodilatation procedure rather than fluoroscopy. And often this can be dictated as well by the facilities and institutions that you work at where some um, machinery or kit may not be available to you. So... I'm going to talk to you about some of the mimics of shoulder pain and certainly frozen shoulder. Now, here's, an here's a radiograph, a shoulder x-ray, a normal shoulder x-ray, and that's actually what I want to see. You know, you might think, well, that's odd. You know, why is the shoulder x-ray normal in frozen shoulder? That is what a frozen shoulder can actually look like, completely normal radiograph. The reasons I want to see an x-ray is to exclude other pathology. Here you can see an example of calcification in the rotator cuff projecting over the rotator cuff tendon here. So here's an example of a patient presenting with calcific tendinitis, uh, an alternative cause for shoulder pain that may be managed. With this example, we can see superior migration of the humeral head. You can see the loss of the acromiohumeral interval here, and there's some early arthritic changes with some glenohumeral uh, joint osteophyte formation and some ACJ arthrosis as well. There's certainly um, a high-grade rotator cuff injury here, if not complete tear of the rotator cuff, allowing for this abnormal superior migration of the humeral head. Here's a good example of rotator cuff arthropathy. So a combination of severe rotator cuff disease, again, we've got superior migration of the humeral head with obliteration or certainly significant narrowing of that acromiohumeral interval, alluding to a big rotator cuff tear. And also glenohumeral joint arthritis with joint space reduction and subchondral sclerosis in tiny osteophytes. So here's an example of rotator cuff arthropathy. And then finally, uh, we have an example of the shoulder. Mm, nothing massively standing out with this on the shoulder radiograph, but remember, don't forget other areas. So here's a soft tissue mass um, in the left lung apex, might be destroying a few of the underlying ribs, but here, this is an example of a pancose tumor. And this is one of those things that you, you, know, you always get worried about. And you certainly see one or two cases like these a year off, off a shoulder radiograph. So it's very important to make sure you've excluded all other potential causes. So just a reminder, from a frozen shoulder perspective, I'm looking for a normal x-ray of the shoulder, um, but the, the pathology that I'm trying to discriminate from include calcific tendinopathy of the rotator cuff, rotator cuff disease or rotator cuff tears, rotator cuff arthropathy, and the pancoast tumor. So in terms of what we do, um, what kind of cocktail um, do we provide to these patients with our, with our images? I wish I was having one now, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm drinking some water instead. So in terms of our approach, I mentioned if you're doing it under fluoroscopy, we use an anterior approach and we access the shoulder using the rotator interval. I tend to use a bit of local anesthetic percutaneously underneath the, the site of the injection. So in the subcutaneous tissues, 
And then I guide a needle through under fluoroscopic guidance into the glenohumeral joint straight down through the rotating interval. And I want to confirm my intra-articular position by injecting a bit of iodinated contrast, first of all, um, a few mils. And once I'm sure I'm in the joint, I then go on and proceed to injecting the rest of my cocktail, which includes some steroid. So triamcinolone, acetonide, mixed in slightly longer acting local anesthetic, I, I, I pretty much use 0.25% labor lubricant now. And then the rest of the, the, the distension of the shoulder is created by 0.9% saline solution, um, which is the bulk of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the fluid that we inject into the joint. And I aim for around about 35 mils, not, not exactly always, but it can vary. Um, but that's the kind of target volume that I go for. Sometimes it might be a bit more, sometimes it might be less. And you find that in some instances, you may elucidate capsular rupture um, of, the, of the shoulder when you're doing the distension. Um, and in others, the capsule doesn't rupture. For me, it doesn't matter. I know some colleagues may want to go for capsular rupture as their endpoint. As far as I'm concerned, I'm very much more um, concerned with trying to stretch those bands of scar tissue. So this schematic is essentially, imagine an, an elastic band that we're trying to stretch I tend to inject fluid and I relax on the plunger with my syringe. I often see it moving backwards and I inject again. And by doing that repetitively over a few minutes, I suddenly feel a give each time and you get more pliability to the shoulder capsule. So for me, getting a, or achieving a capsular rupture is not necessarily the end point. Um, it's more about treating the patient as they are on their merits, injecting slowly and relaxing and trying to distend the shoulder in a very controlled manner. And as I said earlier, physiotherapy is important, probably far more important than what I've done um, with my heart dilatation. It's key that these patients go on to maintain physiotherapy afterwards. So just looking at a few cases now, um, this first case is an example of a patient that had a fairly simple, straightforward going frozen shoulder, not too severe um, at all. And the reason I say that here is my needle insertion into the rotator interval. And I've got contrast outlining the shoulder in the initial stages of the procedure. And as I put more fluid in, you can see greater distension now around the shoulder to get this kind of circular um, appearance of the contrast and the rest of my therapeutic agents in the shoulder. Notice how the glenohumeral joint capsule at the inferior axillary recess is fairly placid here. You know, you've got a nice going pouch. That's important. Keep this in mind as I move on to case number two. Now in case number two in a different patient, we've now um, accessed the rotating interval. I've put some contrast into the joint. Unfortunately, there's a little bit of outlining of the lung and the biceps tendon as well at the same time, which could have been down to the injection as well. But you do sometimes see contrast decompressing into the biceps tendon tube as well as fluid takes the path of least resistance. And in this case, as you go through these progressive images, you can see again, the contrast distending the joint here, as you can see, but this, the, the, the amount of distension that capsule inferiorly is far less compared to our previous case. So I know just looking at these images, I would suspect this patient has got a moderate going frozen shoulder. And essentially it was when we were doing this in practice, because it was a lot, there was a lot more pressure to fight back against when I was injecting. Here's an example um, of, again, a moderate frozen shoulder, which demonstrates capsular rupture. So contrast in, inserted into the joint, distending the shoulder joint. We've got contrast decompression into the long head of biceps tendon sheath. That's not a big problem. We put more fluid in, again, distension, but there's no real big um, lax pouch here. So this tells me the capsule is quite constricted. It's quite scarred down and quite tight. So good going frozen shoulder. Here's a subcorocoid recess filling up with contrast. And with, with a capsular rupture, what tends to happen is you see this contrast start to dilute as it extravasates immediately this way. And that's what you can see on this final image here, contrast extravasating, fluid extravasating immediately. Once you've hit this stage, there is no point in carrying on with injecting because all it does, it just leaks out. So you stop there. Um, I think case four is actually the same. I think I should have uh, removed that. Case five, if we jump to case five, you often see um, frozen shoulder present in patients post-trauma. And here's an example where somebody sustained a fracture dislocation of their right glenohumeral joint. You can see the humeral fracture, and this was subsequently relocated and plated. And we've got a phyllos plate there in situ. This patient developed frozen shoulder in the weeks 
preceding their operation and their physio was more of a struggle and they had restricted movement and pain. So you can perform the frozen, you can perform the harder dilatation as well. In these patients, again, similar approach, contrast outline the joint. We put more contrast in, but there's very little distension here. This is a very good, um, there's very distension of the joint pouch that is at the inferior axillary recess. There's a good going frozen shoulder here in a post-operative patient. So, you know, that's another common indicator for seeing um, frozen shoulder in our practice. And that's all I wanted to say on the context of shoulder interventions. And we talked on the diagnostic and the therapeutic um, image uh, interventions that we have at our disposal in the MSK radiology department. Just to finish off, I thought I'll touch on a brief on hand and wrist intervention and focusing on therapeutic procedures. So here we have a lump commonly associated as a, as a ganglion in the, in the wrist. You can do an MRI scan and you can see on the MRI, this nice signal hyperintense, well-defined lesion, which consists of fluid on this fluid sensitive fat suppress sequence um, in the wrist, which looks very much like a ganglion. And this might well be a little tail. It might be entering or exiting from the um, dorsal band of the scapha lunate ligament is the commonest site that we tend to see. Now, if you didn't do MR, you did ultrasound, you can see it just as well. Here we've got a nice example of that kind of black fluid structure, the ganglion. Um, this is anechoic on ultrasound and this brightness behind it. We describe this as posterior acoustic enhancement. These are the features that tell me that this is actually fluid based rather than it being solid um, uh, structure. So here's an example of um, a ganglion. And then if you moved on to aspiration, um, we often get referred to, to aspirate these under ultrasound guidance, again, as an outpatient procedure where the patient walks in and walks out after 15, 20 minutes, good local anesthetic control subcutaneously around the lesion. And then with the ultrasound probe sat on top, I'll just guide a needle into the, into the center of the lesion. And actually what I do, as well as, as aspirating, as you can see here, the, 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 the reduction in the fluid presence in the, in the cyst, I tend to fenestrate the walls of the cyst as well. So I'll poke through the different margins of the wall and create lots of little holes, if you like, and fenestrate it to try and prevent it from reoccurring. If you make holes in the wall of the cyst, hopefully it'll prevent it from reoccurring. But that is one of the risk factors and you must always consent patients for cyst recurrence. Once I've aspirated, I often inject a little bit of local steroid and anesthetic back into the, into the residual cyst bed just for any niggly inflammation that may well arise from there. De Quaven's tenosynovitis is a common condition to present. And here's the classic example on MRI scan. This is the volar side. These are the flexor tendons. And here we've got the dorsal extensor tendon compartments running across the top. These black um, dots here are the low signal structures of the tendons. But lo and behold, on the dorsal radial side, you can see the first extensor tendon, tendon compartment has lost that normal homogeneous appearance of that low signal of the tendons. And you've got all this peritendinous um, high signal change inflammation. This is Dequaven's tenosynovitis until proven otherwise. Here you can see an ultrasound as well. This time in cross section, we've got the echogenic appearance of a tendon. And if you put Doppler on, you can see with power Doppler, all this inflammatory change around a um, bit of fluid around the tendon as well. This can be injected. And again, you can just guide a needle in either in plane or out of plane around the tendon sheath. So, uh, sorry, in the tendon sheath, but around the tendon to try and dampen down all that inflammation. Increasingly, we get asked to inject the thumb CMC joint and interestingly also the STT joint in, in occasion. Here you can see end stage advanced bone on bone arthritis across the thumb CMC joint with erosive changes here at the base of the trapezium and prominent osteophytes. Um, in some patients, again, who are perhaps not fit for surgery or don't want to have surgery, an injection into the joint may be useful. You can see how tight and narrow that joint is, but ultrasound can identify it. And often we try and inject some low dose steroid into the joint. And I also inject around the periarticular tissues as well, because I think you also get a good going um, pericapsular inflammatory response as well. So the, the cortisone may well help there. Carpal tunnel syndrome, again, a very common pathology to see in people. Um, and you can use ultrasound to diagnose that um, from, a, from a diagnostic perspective. What you see on the ultrasound here on the image on the left is this kind of hypochelic appearance of the median nerve here. These little fine dots represent the individual nerve fibrils. And it tends to have this nice kind of 
oval or round shape to it. And you've got the flexor retinaculum or the transverse carpal ligament running across the top of it. With carpal tunnel, what tends to happen is that, that, that flexor retinaculum can get thickened and it can compress and press on the median nerve. And one of the subtle clues tends to be flattening of the nerves. So now I get to see less of those nice hyperechoic nerve fibrils. The nerve is actually enlarged. It has an increased cross-sectional area as it becomes flattened due to the overlying um, flexor retinaculum pressing down on it. How can we manage that um, radiologically? Well, we can inject um, and bathe the median nerve in the carpal tunnel with some anesthetic and cortisone. So here we've got a needle advancing in. And what I tend to do is I inject both superficial and deep to the nerve and try and separate out the tissue planes between the nerve and the overlying flexor retinaculum in that visit. Again, fairly easy to do. And finally, just touching on trigger digit, um, which again is not uncommonly seen as well. Uh, we know that in the finger, the flexor tendons are held in place via a combination of pulleys, both annular and circular. Um, it's the A1 pulley, the annular pulley that we're concerned with in particular most of the time, which we see is thickened. You can see with these sonogram images um, here that the annular ligament shouldn't necessarily be seen in the normal setting. So if you do see it, it's more invariably abnormally thickened as it is in this case. And that can um, predispose then developing trigger digit or trigger finger. This is in the long axis. This is in the short axis. So the probe turned 90 degrees as if you're looking at the tendon end on, and you can see the annual ligament thickened here. If you put Doppler on, you can see the inflammation around it as well. And this is very easy to inject. Again, under ultrasound, guide a needle into the thickened tendon sheath and we often inject just uh, adjacent to the, the thickened pulley and almost separate it out. And you get to see again with dynamic movement of the tendon, free going, uh, free moving tendon excursion of both the FDS and FDP components there. If you completely tear your annular pulley, you can get this bowstringing effect. And again, that's very easily diagnosable with ultrasound as well. So that's all I wanted to say with today's presentation um, to give you an intro really and highlight the kind of different interventions that we can provide in the MSK radiology department, um, both from a diagnostic point of view, but also a therapeutic point of view. I know I focused a lot on shoulders and we touched a bit towards the end there on some of the kind of more common hand and wrist intervention. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Shub, for that brilliant talk of yours. A uh, couple of questions from our side. Sure. Uh, Shub, uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, does the NICE recommend getting a, a nerve conduction study and EMG before really going in for an ultrasound guided injection? I think it depends on how these things are, 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 well, it depends on who's seeing the patients, really. Sometimes you get such variability on, on the referrals for these things. I know nerve conduction studies are now increasingly used. And in fact, most of my patients I see have already had some form of nerve conduction study. Um, I do work quite closely with a peripheral nerve surgeon at my center. And there's not many people like that. And, you know, he, he's very strong on, on the nerve conduction studies, particularly if he's going to consider operation um, and surgery, whether it's for carpal tunnel or for any other nerve um, compression. And, you know, certainly if the referral comes from the primary sector and primary care from GP or physios, they may not well have referred the patient to, um, to nerve conduction studies at that point. They may well send for an ultrasound scan um, and then consider an injection if there's, if, there's, um, if there's sonographic images that uh, correlate with carpal tunnel. And certainly it's a clinical diagnosis. So some patients will have the injections before they have nerve conduction studies, others have the nerve conduction studies first, and then they get referred for the injection, um, usually as a first line, because, you know, these injections are fairly straightforward to do. Uh, patients walk in and walk out, you know, within 20 minutes or so, having had the injection. And that often settles a lot of those patients down. They may not need to have an operation and carpal tunnel decompression. But eventually, if they do, at least we've tried some of the more non-invasive methods, relatively non-invasive methods in the first instance. And uh, I think the best way to inject is with ultrasound itself, right? Rather than doing a blind injection is always, but sometimes the availability is a concern. For example, you are a MSK radiologist, you have the ultrasound at your disposal anytime. But as orthopedic surgeons, we wouldn't like to do a blind injection. 
No, you're absolutely right. And, uh, you know, certainly in our training days, you know, we used to do all these things all the time, right, uh, in terms of blind injections um, and use anatomical landmarks. And, um, you know, there are studies that show that ultrasound definitely improves your accuracy and your hit rate. And if, if you're performing procedures in the context of trying to work out both from a diagnostic and a therapeutic point of view, whether the patient responds, and, and then you're making a surgical decision based on that. I think it's, it's crucial to, to make sure that you, that the injection has gone in the right place. And if it's not gone in the right place and the patient comes back and says, I got no benefit from the injection. And then they go on to have an operation based on that. You know, you, you kind of, you can be on dodgy ground, um, but you're absolutely right. Availability and accessibility to, to, to operators that perform these, it can often be the, the, the stumbling block. Um, I know most of our injections are referred by our surgeons for image guidance. Um, whilst I know colleagues in other places where they haven't got um, operators to perform such injections, you know, people will blindly inject in their in their clinics in outpatients, or the GP may well inject in 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 their GP surgeries, or the physios often perform blind injections as well. Um, there's a lot more courses dotting around, and, and I'm certainly seeing a lot more interest. Um, globally around around um, ultrasound in general and how to scan and in particular to be able to use it to to inject and I just you know I'd like to just say be very careful along, along those lines you know it it takes a long time to train appropriately um, with ultrasound um, and you know you really have to be experienced before you start using it to to, to inject into people I think. Thank you, Ship, for that. And uh, in similar lines, what has been your experience with ganglion and uh, Nicovin's disease? Are those ones where you inject come from the uh, GPs? Because as surgeons, I would uh, surgeons who always like to excise or release, right? Even surgeons are looking forward for arthroscopic excision of a ganglion. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we're kind of maybe moving, depending on where we are in the world, we kind of tend to, tend to be moving to kind of minimal invasive procedures and you know seeing how the pandemic has evolved as well over over the last couple of years for us all um you know access to surgery has certainly been a problem and access to theater has been premium um whereas you know we've been able to carry on in radiology in performing diagnostic services but also such therapeutic procedures as well the other thing about these injections are, look, you know, patients come in, they're fully awake, you know, I'll give them a bit of local anesthetic, there's no need to have a general anesthetic, there's no need to go to theatre and get admitted into hospital for all their various procedures. So, you know, invariably, a lot of these procedures can be performed fairly quickly and, and, and substantially, a lot of patients can get treatment from it. And that saves the costs of an operation, or it certainly saves patients having to go through an operative surgical route in the first instance. Now, I'm not saying there's no role for surgery. Of course, there can be. But if you've been, if, if you've exhausted the, the relatively non-invasive routes, first of all, and the patients then represent back, I think patients will then be more willing and accepting that, okay, maybe surgery is my, is, is the only way now, particularly when it comes to ganglion aspirations. You know, if they're, if they're simple enough, you know, why not try and aspirate? And then, and then they're off on their way. And if they reoccur, okay, they can either have a second image guided aspiration or the surgeon may well decide at that point, okay, it's come back twice now. You know what? It might just be better to, to, to do it arthroscopically in excise. Uh, and the same goes with our, uh, our dequavins and tenosynovitis and, and most of our injections really, Hithesh, in, in all honesty, it's, it's, about, um, it's about trying to, what, you know, what we can do best for the patient at the time um, everyone's circumstances can be different. Um, there are some patients that will say, no, I want a definitive um, solution to this. I want to go straight to surgery. Sometimes there's not a lot we can do with that. So, yeah. Thank you, Shiv, for that. And just one last question before we wind up the session. And I personally feel the biggest advantage of uh, ultrasound is for detecting fluid. For example, in a deep-seated joint like the hip, I get an ultrasound and I know, okay, quickly, there's an effusion, either it's going to be a transient synovitis or it's going to be a hip arthritis. So do, don't you think in similar lines that the ultrasound is the best way to find fluid? Absolutely. So, you know, we, we have all these imaging modalities um, to hand and they all have their pros and cons. And, you know, as a radiologist, often our job is more like being a detective, you know, and uh, trying to elucidate and find out what the underlying problem is and sometimes one test alone doesn't give us the entire answer and so if, if a radiologist certainly if I 
rely on other imaging modalities. What I try and do is, you know, if it's an MRI scan, you know, we have multiple different sequences that helps us to identify the tissue structures and the tissue contents. But sometimes it can be difficult. Um, whereas I will then switch and maybe suggest an ultrasound scan. Like you say, it's very easy to identify fluid relatively if it's there between simple fluid or maybe thickened tissue like synovium in the context of rheumatology or in chronic inflammation. And that can help us to identify whether, oh, would an aspiration actually be um, successful or not? Because if there's no fluid, you're never going to get any fluid out. Uh, other techniques with ultrasound is uh, you can you can compress things. So if there's something that's superficial and fluid based, you know, by pressing down with the probe and, 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 and the lesion being compressible, it gives you more information there that ah, this this looks more like a, a fluid based cystic component than 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 something more solid. So, yeah, certainly not in our practice, you, you know, if I'm stuck. Uh, I tend to use the various imaging modalities, perhaps, to try and get me out of um, out of trouble, um, and that's 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 why they all have their own advantages and disadvantages. Thank you, Shiv, for the. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for the fantastic lecture, and I'm sure this lecture is going to interest a lot of people all over the world. Thank you again, Hitesh, for your invitation, and I hope it was useful. Thank you.